It's my pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the day, Krista Fischer, who is also a PI in our network. Krista uh, is a professor at the University of Tartu and a member of the Institute of Genomics uh, there. She's an accomplished mathematician. She did her PhD in 1999 in mathematical statistics in, in Tartu, then was a, a postdoc in Ghent, and then and, um, also associate professor in biostatistics in Tartu and an investigator scientist at the MRC biostatistics unit in Cambridge. And uh, now she's a um, she's associate professor of biostatistics at the Institute of Genomics and also professor of mathematical statistics at the University uh, of, of Tartu. Um, she was elected to become a member of the Estonian Academy of Sciences uh, recently, in fact, after the start of this, this ITN. So we also congratulate you on, the, on that. And she is uh, a member of the Estonian um, Corona Task Force, as we would call it in Switzerland. It's the Anti-COVID-19 Research Council advising the, the Estonian government. So uh, Krista always gives very insightful talks uh, at the interface of statistics and life sciences. I also remember um, that she, she once gave a very funny talk where she uh, compared machine learning and statistics and what the differences are. And, and the, the key statement I remember from that was that um, in, in machine learning, uh, grants are just one order of magnitude larger than in statistics. And that's one of the, one of the main differences. Um, now, all jokes aside, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to her talk on, um, on yeah, estimating biological age. Uh, welcome, Krista. We are looking forward to your, to your talk. OK, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, yes, as you uh, Karsten said, so I have uh, two positions. Actually, the main, my main role um, at the University of Tartu is to be professor of mathematical statistics at the Institute of Mathematics and Statistics, but also I have an affi affiliation um, at the Institute of Genomics. So working, my research is con very much connected to the Estonian Biobank. Uh, so yes, uh, today also I uh, my, my examples are all from the Estonian Biobank cohort and um, just um, uh, I, ca I have uh, given a similar talk, uh, so part of the talks are shared from a conference presentation uh, a year ago, so that's why also the survival status and uh, the end date is uh, here like September 2020, but uh, it doesn't change the message. Uh, so the Estonian Biobank cohort um, is uh, now a really huge biobank because uh, given that the Estonian population is 1.3 million, uh, so having a, a biobank with um, about 200,000 participants is something we're really proud of. It's like uh, yeah, almost one sixth or even you, you can say that one fifth of the Estonian adult population are recruited in the biobank as a recruitment, minimum recruitment age is uh, 18, so you have to be adult to give the informed uh, consent um, uh, to join. Now the recruitment has stopped, but um, there have been like three waves of recruitment. So first uh, initial wave were recruited 10,000 participants. Uh, then after a couple of years, uh, so the first wave was mainly done in 2003, 2004. Mm. Then after a couple of years, um, the second wave uh, was conducted and uh, between 2000 and uh, mainly 2008 and 2010 where extra 41,000 participants were recruited as the first um, aim was to recruit total 50,000 participants. Uh, and then uh, there was a third wave also quite recently starting at, from uh, 2018 to 2019, where 150,000 new participants were recruited. So indeed, we now have a cohort of more than 200,000. Uh, but today, I'm mainly concentrating uh, on examples uh, with the first 50,000. As, as you see, we have already quite a long follow-up. So uh, someone who joined in 2003 is now <coughs> 18 years older, and also, um, as uh, you might expect, um, and some people are not anymore alive as, uh, as there was no upper age uh, limit. So of course, if someone 
joins a biobank at 2003, being uh, like 90 years old, since this person is likely not to be alive. Um, and uh, also several younger people. So the picture looks like um, you see here as um, indeed um, uh, the older the individual was, was at recruitment, uh, the more likely the person is not anymore around. And so we have um, now, I think about, yes, close to yeah, even uh, 6,000 actually, yes, this is the most recent linkage information close to 6,000 individuals who have died. Um, how do we know that? Because a cohort is regularly linked to the Estonian causes of, uh, causes of death registry, as all participants <coughs> have given their consent that we can link their, uh, their data with all um, different uh, health-related uh, registers of Estonia. Uh, so yes, how to analyze this data? So, of course, uh, uh, this mortality data is, how to say, not, not a very happy data set, uh, but, but uh, that's uh, life also, that uh, every, every life ends at some point, and the aim, ultimate aim of medicine and developments, and also basically what we do in our network is to provide something that helps people to link, have a longer and healthier life, so the legs to study the length of life of the um, uh, uh, individuals in large cohorts is extremely important uh, to understand what the, uh, are, what are the main factors influencing it. Uh, so, but to analyze such data, um, sorry for typo, uh, survival analysis methods are used. In the, when we had the first um, kickoff workshop in Basel a couple of years ago, I gave uh, two lectures on survival analysis, but um, I expect that people who have needed these methods probably remember it, but uh, the ones who have not needed it in their work might uh, have forgotten some, and maybe all of you were not there. So I just uh, give you a brief overview of uh, the most important concepts. Uh, so uh, survival analysis is a methodology, refers to the general methodology to analyze um, time to event data. So um, we can have a, uh, so actually um, this event, final event, uh, does not have to be death. Same methods are used uh, to analyze, for instance, data on uh, incident diseases. So if the date, uh, the final event is actually date of uh, diagnosis of a disease, uh, it can be anything else. So I have a, uh, uh, seen interesting studies on, say, time to pregnancy of people who are trying to get a baby and uh, maybe have some complications or time to, yeah, but also not even in humans, but I've seen uh, examples from insurance um, uh, area, so time uh, to ending a contract with a, a company and so on. So it's actually quite generalizable to many fields. Uh, so basically, to do the analysis, you have to think of time and time scales. So you are interested in the length of a time interval. It can be time from birth to death. It can be something else. It can be time from biobank recruitment to death or to a diagnosis. Um, so what the problem is, uh, the main problem with survival analysis uh, why we actually need all this methodology is that there is censoring. For many individuals in the study cohort, the survival time is not yet known just because these people are alive. So when we linked the data, uh, the cohort in uh, 2019 with causes of death registry, we knew the survival of participants up to year 2019. So the ones who had died before that, we know for these people that how long did they live, what was the date of death. But for the others who died afterwards, uh, yeah, we were not able to know it in 2019. Now we have, uh, in theory, two years more data, but still, yeah, many participants are alive, luckily, and, uh, and uh, probably none of us can 
survive long enough to be sure that now, now you have measured the survival times of all biobank participants, because uh, like myself, several biobank participants, many of them are younger than me. So, but, uh, so the methods have to handle this feature, so-called censoring, that we know what do we know about these individuals for we know when they were born we know how old are they now or were they last time we linked the uh, data sets so we might know for someone <coughs> that this individual was last time we linked the data was 73 years old but we don't know uh, what happens afterwards but we know kind of lower limit of the or lower bound of the survival time and that can be used there is still another problem that is uh, less frequently mentioned, that is called as left truncation. If we think about the biobank cohort, for instance, if we started, we actually studied a bit later, but uh, think of a cohort where recruitment started of, at year 2000. Uh, if someone uh, who was 80 at some, that time was recruited, uh, then this was not a typical representative of individuals who were born at that time, like eight, uh, in 1920, but it was an, uh, he, he or she was a representative of um, individuals who managed to survive up to year 80. So if you now think of someone, so in, in the biobank we have uh, we had someone who was already 80 at recruitment, and now 20 years later, say at 2020, we also see individuals who were 60 at the time of recruitment, but then eventually became 80. Uh, so these 80 years old, 20 years later, are maybe not completely comparable to the 80 years old, uh, 20 years before. So we have to think about it because the ones before were just a very selective subset, uh, the ones who managed to live that long. And that is called, uh, is creating a problem called left truncation uh, because the individuals actually the ones who died before the recruitment ever started they were never able to join the biobank so we actually don't know anything about them so for the individuals uh, so we have to think of that that in that sense it can't be a random sample and uh, and it, it can be random sample if we think of conditionally that given if we are recruiting people now, so we can pick a random sample of 80 years old who are 80 years old now, but we can't pick a random sample of individuals who were born 80 years ago. Mm. Uh, so now why I'm talking about that, there are like two approaches um, to analyze such data. A standard approach would be to use, um, uh, to have the, the time variables that we're actually interested in defined as time since recruitment. So for everyone, time zero is time of joining the biobank and we just measure time, how long the individual survives or uh, most of the individuals are actually censored, so time to the last data linkage. And, um, uh, and then many methods always say kind of move with a window through the time frame, all the possible follow up times. And at each time moment we observe a death, we look also at the individuals who are at risk at the same time. Who, uh, so kind of if we want to analyze whether one or another covariate, whether it's a biomarker from an omics panel or something else uh, conventional, a risk factor like smoking level or something from diet and, and it, it, if we want to analyze the effects of these risk factors we have to the methods kind of always compare the covariates in individuals who die at some time uh, some time point with individuals who were at risk at that time so if you systematically see that the individuals who die have say higher in average higher smoking levels than, uh, than the ones at risk who still survive, then we can uh, finally derive that um, smoking is a risk factor, for instance. Uh, the methods that uh, consider time since recruitment as a time scale, they can handle censoring quite well, because if someone is censored at some point, 
then this individual goes away from the risk set. So this uh, guy is not anymore at risk when another one is, um, uh, uh, when someone after that censoring time is having, uh, is dying, having the event of interest. Uh, and um, so I come back to that later, but it doesn't handle left truncation that can sometimes create biases. And that's why another approach that has been proposed is to consider age as a time scale. But also in the analysis, we have to, uh, as you see here, the lines on this graph, uh, they don't start at the age zero at birth, but they start at the age where individual joins a biobank. So the starting point of each line is the uh, time age where individual joins a biobank. So it's only, this example shows only individuals uh, older than 75 at recruitment, just to see, show sufficient number of events or deaths also in the graph. And then uh, we consider, oh, sorry, the individuals at risk, uh, those individuals who were already recruited in the biobank by that age. So if someone dies, say at age 92, uh, this individual has an event and then the risk set are individuals who have joined the biobank being younger than 92 and who did not die or were not censored before the age of 92. So they were under follow-up at the age of 92. Uh, so and that approach um, this time uh, has been shown to handle left truncation. We also, I think in Basel, I also showed some slides on simulations on that, that uh, to convince that indeed um, the survival models in this case give unbiased estimates. And also we have to, um, there are some other reasons why it's uh, easier because uh, we can interpret the estimated, um, estimated quantities um, as risk that is depending on age quite naturally uh, and not risk depending on time since recruitment as recruitment does not change risk or for anyone hopefully and uh, and so it's not an important time point in the, in life in that sense um, so recruitment is not a meaningful time zero and we use follow-up time. So we get also some survival curves estimated in age scale. As you see this graph here, you see on x-axis, there is an x-axis is the age axis. Here, as we only had adults, so it runs from 18 to more than 100. Y-axis is a probability of surviving. So what we estimate is a survival function that is a probability of surviving past given time t. Uh, of course, the older um, we get, the smaller the probability gets. And if we say that at 105, it's uh, more or less, it's very close to zero for most of us. And, um, and that's why the function has that shape as you see here. And in Estonia, we really see quite a big um, gap in the life that is also seen in biobank data, I hope uh, that can be shortened as in um, uh, countries with a very high, not, but anyway, some countries are doing also worse, much worse. Uh, so how to estimate this survival function? Just let me know if you don't hear me because I saw a message that my internet connection was unstable, but uh, I hope you're here. Um, you were only gone for a second, so we could hear and understand the full sentence. It, okay. was, not a, it was not a long gap here. Yeah. Okay, great, great. So, uh, the most popular kaplan mayer estimate is, um, or most uh, popular estimate of the survival function is a kaplan mayer estimate. kaplan mayer estimate uh, is um, also like moving through the span of the time axis that we have here. If it's age, then it is age, all ages that we have in the data set. At each age where we observe a death, 
<coughs> so, um, we count how many deaths we observe, quite often it's one, sometimes it's more than one. Risk. Yeah, one this ri and um, we divide so um, it's a kind of um, estimate of instantaneous now you, were go now you were really gone for a sentence or so so there, there okay was a gap. There was a gap. okay sorry i tried to repeat again so at each uh, time point we count the number of deaths we count the number of um, individuals at risk so as you see if you don't, uh, if there are no deaths observed at this time point, uh, you don't add a term to the product because it will be just one. And what you estimate here, basically, you estimate the conditional probability of surviving past that time point because you take the probability of dying at that time point, given that you are at risk, you are part of the RI. And if you take one minus, it's like probability of not, not dying. So, and that we also saw in Basel. So, yeah, uh, that is estimate. This estimate can handle censoring and it can handle left truncation if the time axis is um, H. And now we can also go more specific. It uh, don't have to be only men and women. It can be also people having different values of biomarkers. And I come, come to models also soon, just to let you know that different omics layers enable really um, detailed analysis of pathways leading to mortality. If there are any questions in the meantime, let me know either in the chat window or just asking. Mm. I will do. Let, let me check the chat. There's none at the moment. So. Yeah. Okay. I'll let you know when there are. Okay. So for modeling, um, we actually think of another important function, and that is hazard function. Mm. That seems a bit more complex, so for, not for mathematicians, but maybe for others. And hazard function is kind of instantaneous risk. It's a conditional probability, conditional that you live up to that age. Say if this small t is say 60, conditional that you live up to 60, uh, the probability we ask what is after becoming 60. And so it's a small time interval between t and t plus dt, and we go with that to limit. So it's kind of a function that measures instantaneous risk. If you know the value of hazard function because of this limiting, it does not really have a direct interpretation, but we work quite often with proportional hazards models that assumes that covariates affect the hazard. And most famous um, approach, modeling approach, is the Cox proportional hazards model, uh, named after David Cox. Um, I think David Cox is born in 1924, and he's still alive and was quite recently giving uh, seminar talks. Quite an amazing person in, uh, from Oxford who in 1972 proposed the analysis approach. So the model states that conditionally on covariates, the hazard consists of baseline hazard that can be anything, but that doesn't depend on covariates. And the covariates multiply the hazard by something. This something can be larger than one or smaller than one. So it could they could make the hazard either higher or also lower. So if you look at the um, hazard ratio that corresponds to a unit change um, in one covariate, it is just e to the power of this parameter beta. 
That's why the parameter estimates from proportional hazards models are also interpreted as log hazard ratios. And actually, mathematically, the estimation idea is quite uh, nice. Um, the concept of partial likelihood that comes down to quite a simple um, or relatively simple function that has to be maximized. But we're not going into details here, just to, uh, just to notice that that is a main analysis approach and that is implemented in many standard software packages. So using this methodology, also some, some tricks to make the algorithm running in Jiva setting as it didn't, um, it was quite slow initially, uh, but uh, some modification, we were able to actually run some Jiva analysis. And the first paper um, we published with colleagues, colleagues from Edinburgh was published in 19, or 2015, 2015 or 2016. And then several follow-up papers were, where we discovered some SNPs that were associated with lifespan. But it's interesting uh, to know that the very first Chivas where we had uh, about 270,000 lifespans, but not of the participants of from the UK Biobank, but of their parents. And so as each participant also told whether their parents were alive and uh, if they were not alive and what age did they die. And, and as a, a participant received his or her DNA from parents, so the association between participants DNA and parental lifespan was also valid to provide information about uh, genetic markers associated with um, the lifespan. And actually two markers um, came out. Uh, and these two markers uh, are quite um, um, Mm, are quite fine, uh, are quite um, interesting as first of them is actually known to be associated with smoking behavior uh, with uh, people to get addicted to smoking and um, and another one was associated with um, just cholesterol level and, uh, and known cardiovascular risk factors. So, and based on the later studies, we were able to put together a polygenic risk score for lifespan actually. And um, the polygenic risk score consisted of um, several thousand markers. And um, yeah, this actually gave us an opportunity to see that individuals um, at the first polygenic risk score decile had um, clearly lower, um, uh, say higher uh, median survivals and individuals at the um, 10th decile. So the difference was not so huge, but uh, about three to five years, as you see in the median. So also quite an interesting finding. Uh, then I can also show you another study about some other omics. Um, Markers and this is about NMR-based biomarkers. That means nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy-based biomarkers. Quite interesting data we had at um, the Estonian Biobank. And um, that paper came out actually even earlier, 2014, where we found that, surpri that there is a surprisingly strong effect by some uh, NMR biomarkers on. Um, on uh, all cause mortality and also cause specific mortality. So now if you put these two things together, this polygenic risk score and NMR um, uh, biomarkers, this is now a slide I haven't shown much and uh, this is uh, still unpublished, but um, it's quite interesting that you can see quite a huge difference. Mm. If you look at one end, for instance, men who have 
high polygenic score and also high score based on the NMR biomarkers. Mm. And also the men who have uh, one the other end, they have both scores low. The difference between their expected survival, so if you look at the 50% um, horizontal line at 0.5 is where the median lies. So the median is uh, only like about 60 years in one end and more than 80 years uh, or something like 85 on the other end. Mm. And also the two other curves are quite clearly distinct. So you can see that both scores, not just one, so there is a polygenic score plus the NMR based score, they are clearly having an effect. And not only for males, also for females, you could just see that the, for females, it's very interesting that if the NMR score is low, like in the uh, be, below median, I would actually say, mm, then uh, there is not uh, the polygenic score doesn't seem to contribute. But if uh, NMR score is high, then the polygenic score apparently gives something extra. So it's, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, story. Anyway, but if we get these kind of plots, uh, that is nice to see, that is scientifically interesting, but um, we can also, we also have to think of our biobank participants. At least in Estonia, we have promised that uh, our individuals um, or our participants will get some feedback at some point. And um, yeah, yes, yeah, uh, so, but what, what can you say? What can you say to an individual knowing that uh, he or she is either on the red or the green or the blue or the yellow line or orange one? Uh, why it's not informative? Because, so suppose we take someone at the age of 70. If this individual is actually on the red uh, curve here, we see that uh, case this individual actually didn't have very high probability to live up to 70, but we have one guy who actually is 70. So we can't tell that uh, your probability of being alive now, now is uh, 25%. We have to say that um, yeah, we, we have to say something about expected future. So we have to work with conditional probabilities. So, for instance, um, if we have someone of age 70, then we have to think of conditional probability of living, surviving up to 80, given that we already know that this guy is 70 now. And, and that you you could derive it from the curve by dividing two values. So the current value at the age of seven in, is uh, in the denominator and in the numerator the value at the age of 80, but you can't see it so directly so easily from the plot. So there is another, another alternative idea. And this idea is to actually use a concept called biological age. So, uh, what the idea is, is uh, that if we know that we have biomarkers, a lot of biomarkers, like we had this NMR biomarkers, we had polygenic score, uh, we can, op instead of uh, plotting survival curves, we can estimate the expected age of the individual given his or her biomarker profile. And we call that as a biological age. If you have a biological age that is uh, Greater. So if you're right now, say 50, but you get an estimated biological age of 60, then you kind of think that your risk level, overall risk level is more comparable to someone of the, at the age, of age 60 and um, not related to, uh, so you maybe have to do something about it. Or if you get Inform, informed that your biological age is now 40, then you know that your biological age is actually younger than uh, your real age, so you're doing absolutely fine. Mm. So that could be better in interpretation. But uh, if you look, um, so yes, you can look some papers at some papers on biological age, for instance, metabolomic and epigenetic aging is a really popular topic. So the idea is that, um, I said, okay, yes, yeah, so the idea is quite simple. We have the biomarkers, we have actual age, we fit some uh, model, 
you can do simple regression, but if we have a lot of biomarkers, I think machine learning could do better. And, uh, and we try to predict, uh, get the predictor for age. And then we look at the individual predictors. As you see, you don't get points on the line. You see deviation from actual age and uh, this predicted age. And that deviation will tell something about the risk. Well, I did something very simple in this Estonian Biobank also. I, I just used multiple linear regression and or stepwise linear regression and tried to mm, use a training set with 1,000 individuals and, and uh, predicted age in the validation set for 9,000. Mm, but um, yeah, just to illustrate, uh, this is not so important that maybe I didn't get the perfect estimator. You can think that, OK, you take the individual uh, whose um, real age is 40. And you see that for this individual, the predicted age is rather close to 60, and you could tell something about risk. So the correlation is about 0.7. So um, does it make sense? Is it helpful? I looked at the association of the biological age with some other risk factors. And uh, I saw that. Um, so for instance, if you look at the difference between biological age and re real age, so females seem to be biologically one year younger. Makes sense. Also, one year is too little, given that we have very uh, quite much stronger age dif or difference uh, between two genders in our expected lifespan. Body mass index, high, having high body mass index, OK, makes you two years older. Yeah, OK, makes sense, but maybe we should expect more. Smoking makes you four years older. But what is funny, having at least secondary education seems to make you four years older. That is contrary to what we see in survival analysis. If we look at the Cox model and hazard ratio, we see that educated people have lower hazard. Also, having passed myocardial infarction seems to make individuals younger. But if you look at hazard ratios, it's two. So if you have had one myocardial infarction, you are definitely at higher risk. And uh, it's the same for prevalent cancer. So uh, yes, if we had tried to adjust additionally for um, real age, we see these differences more or less disappearing. But that is probably what we shouldn't do. And, but we still would expect that smoking would make a difference. So now the question is, why are some association opposite to the effect on mortality hazard? We can think of our cohort, actually, uh, like the education thing. People who have at least, uh, people who don't have secondary education, uh, there are many more of them in older generations than in younger generations, where uh, secondary education became really accessible for everyone and um, and uh, promoted and actually compulsory kind of so that is um, and so then if you regress your biomarkers uh, on age biomarkers that for some reason are associated with secondary education um, they also tend to be correlated with um, uh, with age in in that way that okay older people uh, have less education. So, so you kind of see confounding. I can um, show you another graph on that. So what is actually going on? You're hoping that your age is having effect on biomarkers. And then there are some other risk factors like smoking, bad diet, um, and other so bad habits, maybe underlying diseases that also have effect on these biomarkers. And these biomarkers uniquely tell something about risk level. And so if your, uh, so if your risk level seems to be more re resembling someone of younger or older age than you, then you can think that it has to do with CC modifying that. But it is not so easy if you know something about causal inference. It's not so easy to see from this picture why it is like that and uh, why it should be like that. 
uh, so you can um, probably if uh, indeed there is no for, for instance uh, z does not have uh, any direct effect on risk it only works via via x then you could probably assume it, it is okay but but not in general for instance uh, what we also see in the Estonian biobanks that if smokers tend to be younger so smoking prevalence has increased in times so old people in old people you see more individuals who have never smoked than in younger generation but smoking is something for instance nmr biomarker profile is strongly affected by smoking so and but but now if you look at the association between um, biomarker profile and age so the smoking associated biomarkers say kind of mirror not the, the effect of um, not only the harmful effects of smoking but also the fact that smokers are younger. So if you have a biomarker level uh, that is associated with smoking, high, uh, a certain level of this biomarker can reflect either lower smoking level or uh, older age, and you can't uh, tell the difference. So you see, it's, it's a bit um, complicated to do it like that. Uh, so you see that it doesn't necessarily tell you about risk level and uh, probably something should be modified. And so, so we have proposed an alternative approach that you actually look at these survival curves, not the linear regression. And suppose uh, given the Cox model, the predicted survival, survival curve for you or for a certain individual is a blue one, and for the population is a black one. And now you see that um, for uh, that, okay, given that you are right now 50, you see your uh, probability of uh, surviving past 50 is actually a bit lower than in average in population. Or if you move to the horizontal, uh, horizontally, if you move to the right, you see that your risk level currently is about the same as in the population about uh, five years later as for someone in the uh, for someone being 55 in average in the population so you kind of can tell from here oh sorry from here that your biological age would be 55 given that risk profile uh, so actually now if you see here the point 50 and you see the point where the dotted line leads and how it comes from that you look at the point of the on the population survival curve and ask what age does it correspond to uh, then you have to be able to solve it analytically the problem is that this kaplan meyer method is non-parametric method and so you don't get the simple formula from there you can have a a kind of non-parametric estimate that as well, of course. Uh, what you can do alternatively, you can um, uh, look at some parametric approaches, but let's first look at the formulas. So suppose you have this unconditional survival function in the cohort, just the average, uh, and then you have individual survival functions that now comes from your covariates that is measured. So you are looking for a time point where the population survival function is the same as your survival function at your current age. So these two functions have to be equal. And now this TB is something that you actually want to find. That is a risk-based biological age. It can be solved if you find a nice distribution fitting your model, fitting, fitting your data. And if we are working with human survival in biobanks, uh, that is not the survival of people with specific disease, that is just general survival, then uh, it looks like Gompert's distribution fits remarkably, um, surprisingly well, actually. And Gompert's distribution is a simple distribution where hazard function is just an exponential function of time. And it has two parameters, A and B. One, um, if A is um, 
negative then it's actually a decreasing hazard if a is positive it's an increasing hazard and uh, so usually we would assume that the hazard is increasing for humans and b is just a scale multiplier and survival function also has it has two exponentials but otherwise it's relatively simple so given this parametric form so we know what function it is so if we go back we see the quality we can actually solve it so again i'm not going into details how it al algebraically comes but uh, just if you have estimated individual survival function you have the population survival function you can estimate now what comes out uh, what came out was um, first of all you see that the correlation between real age and biological age is better but that is because uh, age is already like built in in the estimation tool or in the estimation mechanism so if uh, population survival curve and individual survival curve were always equal then we would actually have a straight line but then it wouldn't be interesting because biological age would be equal to the real age but uh, just having more and more covariates creates these deviations and now you if we look at the association of the so estimated biological age with um, known risk factors most of them do make sense um, they go in the right direction like body mass index and smoking increasing biological age and uh, also having past myocardial infarction or prevalent cancer and education decreasing but only the sex difference that is actually very strong doesn't uh, isn't uh, reflected by that biological age um, how to get uh, it corrected actually we could uh, if we have a survival model already so if we go back and what we want to do we want to estimate this blue line as well as possibly possible for individuals why don't we put this like sex effect into the model already why don't we add other well-known uh, well-known risk factors we get actually weaker correlation between uh, biological age and real age because we see more variation between individuals in that way and here now if you look at the difference between biological age and real age now you really see that uh, yes females are biologically or according to this risk age they are uh, younger high body mass index increases the biological age smoking also increases and also having myocardial infarction or cancer and education kind of uh, takes you six years off uh, so if we now look at the different versions uh, we actually if we look at the difference between biological age and real age and we use the first approach linear regression of course yeah we can do better with machine learning as i said but uh, still you might have the problems that uh, given your data if your youngest real age is 20 then 20 year olds can only be biologically older and uh, 80 years old can only be or mainly be biologically younger using that so that is mm, that you can be biologically older than you really are mm, that is actually that decreases with age actually yeah? because your probability of being biologically younger increases with age uh, version two if we only used metabolomics and not as a risk factors actually you see that uh, the difference is not associated with the real age that is uh, good because indeed at any age you can be either biologically older or younger depending on your um, biomarker profile and um, and you can also see that uh, the hazard that you can't be really more than much more than uh, quite often than 10 years younger than your real age version 3 gives most of variability you can be biologically quite often more than 10 years younger 
and also more than 10 years older. Uh, so, and, uh, and to summarize, I would say that the uh, causal infer interpretation of the uh, conventional biological age uh, that does remain unclear. Uh, quite often, you have to think carefully how is it obtained, uh, what does it reflect, and probably it is, uh, it is also good to play around with, but whether the feedback based on that is, um, can be taken seriously, it's another question. Uh, we have proposed an alternative that has a more direct interpretation. And uh, for research, I don't know whether we need it. If we go back what we did, we, we fitted a regression, we fitted a Cox proportional hazards model having the biomarker profile and also all other risk factors as covariates. We can study what, the, what are the hazard ratios corresponding to each of these factors. And that might be sufficient for research. But if we want to tell individuals what, what is actually the risk level and how to say understand about the risk level, uh, this um, biological age might be more intuitively intuitive. So if you say that uh, smoking increases your mortality hazard two by two times, um, it is an uh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't tell you much, probably, for maybe for scientists who have worked with survival analysis a lot and the proportional hazards model, it's interesting to know, but, uh, but not for general people. But if you tell that smoking makes you like biologically seven years older, it kind of puts seven years on you, then uh, that is probably something that the individuals can much more clearly interpret. Uh, so, and uh, here actually, I want to finish with um, my um, uh, main part of the lecture. I'm happy to answer any question. I'm sorry I hadn't been lecturing for <laughs> some time and, uh, and my voice was breaking in the middle of the talk, but now I'm quite fine answering any of your questions. Thank you very much. A very exciting talk, uh, Krista. We send a round of applause to you here. Um, and now we have time for questions. Giovanni has a question. Yes, please, Giovanni. Thank you for your very interesting talk. I have a very uh, probably basic question. What are the kinds of applications that you would see for these type of risk score? Say you were able to develop a very good risk score that is highly predictive. Would you aim to use it for something like interventions, notifying people that are flagged as high risk so that they can fix their lifestyle or some other application? Uh, yeah, one of the, inter uh, the applications that has been or, or kind of uh, uh, also research direction is to use Mendelian randomization further. So if you find uh, like uh, for polygenic risk scores, if you find um, uh, genetic markers that predict lifespan, then you can also look at the genetic correlations of, um, of lifespan between uh, with other things and that you can derive. So what is actually how much of the effect comes from, uh, say, smoking, how much comes from uh, your uh, liability to get the heart disease, uh, how much it comes from liability to get cancer. As, uh, yeah, and that was actually done in all one of these uh, papers by Paul Timmers and others um, in, published in eLife. Uh, but another, so once you have uh, all this uh, information, also the feedback, I think people, uh, there are also some apps developed and so on to give uh, like feedback about biological age to individuals. So maybe just improving the methodology makes these estimates uh, more precise, more accurate. So indeed that individuals who actually have higher hazards, say get that feedback, say no. So knowing that um, your biological age is older than your real age and, and uh, seeing reasons for that, that okay. One reason that changes, changes that is smoking, another is that uh, probably 
your diet is not so good as, uh, or uh, uh, maybe there is something like your body mass index is too high. Mm. That would also be maybe helpful in interventions, or, or maybe also it's nice to know that if uh, people who have done anything, everything uh, as well as possible and then get confirmations that they are biologically younger than they really are, that is also nice to know. So it's, uh, but yeah, also interventions could be uh, also considered, I think. Thank you. Thank you. To Giovanni and Krista. Vesna has a question, please. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question about uh, the kaplan meier curve because uh, I recently started reading about it and I was wondering if it's possible to spot the presence of censored data uh, by just looking at the curve, the shape of the curve or... Uh, that is an interesting question. I think by looking at the curve, um, it is not so easy to tell was um, sometimes the curves if, if the data sets are small censored uh, um, uh, sensorings have been marked on the curve with a kind of line you, you can prob probably the default by r at some point it was but in general i would say it's that is no, not so an easy way to tell was there is and well that is one way still if you look at the end of the curve if everyone had died in the court uh, the curve will end at zero because uh, then you know when the last one had died. If uh, if not, then the curves uh, do not uh, all end at zero, as you see also here. They don't end at zero. So so that, that is one uh, thing. But but it, the curves can end at zero, but uh, there can be censoring just um, depending on whether the last observation was actually a death or censoring. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vesna. Thank you, Krista. Krista, I have a question for you. It's a, it is a bit like the elephant in the room for me. Um, after the introduction in which I said that you are part of the Estonian Corona uh, Task Force. So can you apply this thinking to Corona? Because there, there are these people who say like uh, all, the, all the ones who died from Corona would have died anyway. So, so can you give the number of years that the corona infection makes you older, for example? Yes, I think that even has has been done. I, I can't tell you the number. I know that the hazard ratio of roughly uh, two is um, can be applied, but it also depends on uh, very much on what time frame are you looking at. So in ger general, like uh, probability of dying within a year uh, at any age group, uh, given that you get infected by corona is two times higher than the hazard uh, of not dying within a year um, of yeah hazard uh, the hazard ratio is uh, roughly two but how long does it last if you look at the uh, first months after getting infected like i i looked at certain age group, group like men uh, older than 80 where the probability of dying after uh, getting infected was really high, was something like 25% in Estonia, or you say 20% uh, based on Estonian data. So if a man older than 80 gets uh, infected, so the one in five will die. And that happens within a month. It is not so that the one in five, uh, uh, 80 or so, uh, oh, uh, 80 plus men will die within a month uh, in population in general. So that is much much higher risk ratio. So um, uh, uh, so it's uh, indeed a uh, question, what is the best way to present it uh, as, as uh, COVID is yes, something that creates very high risk immediately, but the long-term hazards um, still need to be studied. Actually, these studies are on ongoing and also our first um, results show that for older individuals, the high increased hazard can, uh, can stay for quite long. Thank you. Younger ones, we don't see it really. Thank you. That makes sense. Are there further questions? So I, I should mention that Krista kindly agreed also to meet our um, ESRs for a half an hour discussion round. So I invite all ESRs um, to, to join this discussion round. I think Krista, again, she also jumped in here for uh, an external speaker who, um, who got sick. 
So that and I would like to uh, also acknowledge her efforts in in co-organizing this um, summer school. It was originally uh, scheduled to take place in Tartu in Estonia, but uh, due to Corona, we had to move it online. Uh, that's unfortunate. We all would have uh, liked to see Estonia, but uh, still, I I think we had a very good start into the first day, and I hope for further exciting. Days. And I thank Krista both for her talk and for her uh, efforts in, in uh, co organizing this. Okay. Yes. Thank you very I much. Just, mm, uh, thank you very much, Karsten. I also wanted to say that actually I feel a bit uh, uh, guilty that I, I wasn't really involved so much involved in organizing it, and you, Karsten, and uh, Katarina did uh, most of the um, work. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm really grateful because indeed, uh, yeah, it, first of all, we were not able to have it in Tartu and then uh, I was really extremely busy with and I'm still <laughs> extremely busy with all that COVID stuff that unfortunately is still bothering us quite a lot. Um, we hope that vaccines uh, will finally turn things to good direction. Yeah. I just That's perfectly to... understandable, but you support us whenever we were discussing speaker invitations and so on. So we are, yeah, we are yeah, grateful but, but for that. Yeah, but okay. but it's good. Um, but I just wanted to say that uh, the reason why I'm not in my office in Tartu, I'm in actually in Riga, uh, telling you from a conference room, is that I'm busy with also <laughs> some other duties, uh, being as a member of the executive board of the International Biometric mm -hmm. Society, that is the largest society of biostatisticians, biometricians. Um, we're organizing um, an international biometric conference in Riga next July in Riga, Latvia. I think it's a very, uh, my favorite conference special um, of biostatisticians working either in medicine, biology, forestry, agriculture, uh, so quite in wide, wide range. And it's um, a first time in history the conference is uh, in this Nordic Baltic region at all. Uh, next next one will be in 2024 in Buenos Aires. So if you want to come to this conference uh, while it's in Europe, then uh, July 22 is a good time. <laughs> so and okay, but now I'm happy to discuss uh, in breakout room. <laughs> so we recommend this event, and we thank you again, and wish you and the students a, a, a very good discussion in the breakout room. Yeah. Take care, everyone. We'll see you at the latest tomorrow morning, 8.30, with the next uh, Thank speaker. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.